I want to start my talk by um, talking about circularity. Uh, just I want to take a little show of hands. How many of you are familiar with the notion of the circular economy? Can you show me your hands? If you've heard of the circular economy. I don't see many at all. Uh, I'm not surprised. Circular economy is a relatively recent concept. Uh, really, we first started to hear about it a little more than 10 years ago, and it brought together lots of ideas of other environmentalists, people thinking about the issues uh, of climate change, of energy use, of waste, etc., trying to come up with uh, a system, an approach that could really help solve these issues. Uh, our current uh, way of doing things, the economic and material production system that we use, is often characterized as take, make, dispose. And what this means is, of course, the first step is to gather resources. This is the taking part, the extraction. Maybe some of them are uh, renewable and many of them are not renewable, but we take these resources, then we make something out of them. We're making our products, our cars. Maybe it's food. Uh, maybe it's an appliance. Maybe it's uh, something simple like a pair of socks. Uh, and then we have a use phase of that as well. But when we're done with it, even if we're recycling some of this, and it's good, recycling's a good step, uh, it's often not enough, we end up disposing it. And this is either incineration or landfill, uh, there's almost no other way. It eventually goes back, it's junk that we have to either burn or bury. What the circular economy proposes is uh, to turn this into a cycle. Say, this needs to be a cycle. Uh, not this one-way road to disaster because all of this disposal, the way we're doing things, of course, has had tremendously uh, damaging effects for our environment and our, our life. At the beginning, of course, we need to uh, get the resources. We gather the resources. Uh, and again, these could be uh, renewable things, what we might call biological inputs, living things, wood, cotton, uh, biological fibers, other things that are renewable in that sense because they're alive. Of course, there will need to be non-renewable resources as well. The minerals, again, the extraction, the metals, other things that we use. Uh, we would like the circular economy to be powered by renewable energy as well. Uh, then, of course, there's going to be a phase of making things, a production system. Uh, this should be efficient. This should also not use more energy than it needs to. It should be as unpolluting as possible. Uh, we have the distribution phase, which of course also has a large impact on the environment. How do we get things from where they're being made to the people who want to use them? And, and what are the effects of that? What are the consequences of that? Uh, we get to the use phase. That's us using our cars, using our uh, you know televisions, using our shoes and our socks, etc. cetera. Uh, now, the next thing is the key. We want to upcycle as much of this as possible. Now, this term upcycle, of course, is based on the notion of recycle. And upcycle really was popularized by, uh, you know, uh, McDonough and Brownhart. This uh, pair, one is an architect, one was uh, a researcher who came up with this term upcycle to say, no, we don't want to recycle things because ultimately they'll become waste eventually. We want to try to bring things back up to the top of this whole process to have materials and other things that we can bring back as resources uh, in order to start this thing again. And to do this in a way that will regenerate natural capital. And natural capital is everything that's alive and keeping us alive in this biosphere. So of course it means the soil, it means the plants, it means the living things, it means the atmosphere, it means the rain, it means all of those things together. Uh, we want to regenerate uh, the, the entire system as much as possible. And this alone, of course, is, is quite something. This is quite a concept. It, it shouldn't have taken us uh, this many centuries to come up with this, but it really took a lot of people thinking about this very hard to really, within the last decade, to, to, to pull this together to make it into a system. But um, the, the key, again, is that we're minimizing waste. Like, that's the main thing. We want to minimize waste. Now, within this are what we call loops. Uh, one is, from the user standpoint, you can reuse and repair the things you do uh, that you have uh, so that they don't become waste. Keep them uh, in use as long as possible. You want to make them uh, usable for as long as possible. Uh, there is a redistribution loop. Maybe you're tired of your sofa. Uh, so instead of just junking it, putting out for Sodaigomi, uh, you can uh, make it available uh, as a use, use furniture. Uh, you know, somehow redistribute that. That can be done with almost everything we, we make to, to bring it back uh, into the distribution uh, system so that it can go to someone else to prolong the use of it. And of course, there is reconditioning. Uh, 
and one thing that's already happening uh, in manufacturing and automobiles and appliances, many other things, is to make these uh, things that they're selling uh, modular and able to be uh, uh, reconditioned and then to make new products out of them. So this is kind of a novel idea. So this whole thing with this main loop from the getting the resources to bringing things back as resources and all these sub loops, you know, to prolong the life of things, the usable life of things, this is what we call circularity. And it is, again, a, a relatively recent idea that pulls together um, the cradle-to-cradle -cradle notion from uh, McDonough and Brown. It brings together the blue economy. It brings biomimicry. It brings a, a lot of ideas of some very, very interesting thinkers together uh, into this entire system. And the good news is that this is getting a lot of attention and a lot of buy-in, both from manufacturers, from builders, construction companies, and from government and regulators. Uh, I would say probably more so in Europe than anywhere else. There are now regulations being passed that are requiring goods to be manufactured in as circular a way as possible. Uh, and hopefully this will have an effect. And again, uh, if you look even in Japan, the last big conference for circular economy uh, thinking brought about 200 Japanese companies. So this is really uh, a kind of a new thing, but it really has a lot of promise. Uh, so, again, just to summarize some of the key points, what this seeks to do is to maximize use and minimize waste, and some of the ways to do it is by dematerialization, to make things with as little material as possible. You don't need a big wooden beam if you can use a thin piece of wood. Uh, you don't need a big heavy piece of metal to, for your car if you can have a thin piece of some sort of fiberglass or carbon. Uh, modularity of design, again, making things that they can be disassembled, reassembled, the bad parts can be somehow uh, taken care of and the, the usable parts can then be reused. Uh, product life extension, to do as much as we can to have these things usable for as long as possible before they enter into some sort of uh, recycling or, or, or upcycling or, or waste flow. And finally, this notion of uh, don't need, everything doesn't need to be a product that people own. There are other ways to provide for people's needs. Sharing is one of them. Renting is another. Uh, there's other ways as, as well to share things. Not everyone has to buy everything and have the same thing. So one of the interesting things that I want to talk about is that almost every aspect of this circular economy, this circularity, this relatively recent thinking has been anticipated, tried, and was successful in the Edo period of Japan. And again, the Edo period, this was a long time ago. This began around 1600. It lasted until the middle of the 19th century when this, the nation opened to the West and uh, became, in effect, a new modern state. Uh, but before that, for 250 years, they had uh, managed to create a very sustainable society, one that would fit, again, circularity. It would certainly comply with almost all of the SDGs, the UN Sustainable Development Goals as well, quite a lot of them. Uh, and the key was they were forced into it. Japan, of course, is a small nation, relatively small nation, very mountainous. Not a lot of arable land for f growing food and not a lot of resources. Large population, uh, 30 million people or so at this point. That's as much as Poland or Venezuela now. It's a big country. Uh, having to feed those people was a big challenge. Uh, it had a good climate. It was very literate. Uh, it was also very well organized. Uh, fortunately, uh, compared to us, well, they didn't have to deal with climate change. That was a really, really good thing in their favor. But because of about 200 years of war in the country and, and uh, cutting the forest to build castles, to build ships, to build all sorts of things, uh, the entire nation became deforested before the 1600s, before the start of the Edo period. Uh, it, this was disastrous because if you clear cut a forest, uh, you, you're removing the protection of the watershed. You have uncontrolled landslides. You have rivers being silted up. They become uh, you know, bad places for, for all of the fish and the living things, uh, also hard to, to, to navigate. Uh, they are going to flood unpredictably. The flooding will damage the agriculture. Uh, if you don't have uh, good agriculture, then people are going to go hungry. It's this cascading of, of dominoes. Uh, but they reversed it. Within a few generations, uh, they managed to reverse the damage and ushered in over 200 years of wise environmental resource management. Uh, and the big thing is, how did they do that? And a lot of it was just the way they thought. 
Uh, and again, there's something we can learn. So in our era, uh, we think of things like water or forests or energy or waste or food to be separate. You can become an expert in any of these. You can get a graduate degree in any of these, like water, without ever having to learn about waste. You could get a degree in food without ever having to learn about energy. But of course, they're all connected. And I think people of the Edo period understood this very well. It was not our notion of a scientific, analytical understanding, but empirically and through their experience, they knew that these things are connected. Water and energy are connected. For instance, if you make hot water. Uh, anytime you're gonna make hot water, well, you are then having this vector that connects these two, and if you can somehow improve that process, for instance, with more efficient use of energy, then you are now making benefits on both sides, both the water side and the, uh, ener and, the, and the energy side. They're vectors that are connecting all of these things and more. It's a very, very complex interconnected system uh, where if you tug on something over here, this little thread, you may cause something to collapse over there. And I, again, I think Edo people really understood uh, that very, very well, partly intuitively, but largely through their experience. If you fail to understand this and acknowledge it in the way you make and do things and use things and what you do after you're finished using them, this can be this catastrophic interaction, again, this collapse of dominoes, uh, but we want to find a way to change this into a virtuous cycle. Use those same interdependencies in a positive way. And uh, I use the phrase multiform solutions. We, we know this expression to kill two birds with one stone. Well, I like to argue that the Japanese of the Edo period constantly were killing five birds, six birds, ten birds with one stone, finding a single solution that helped solve many problems at once. Uh, nowadays, we would talk about this in terms of systems thinking. Uh, really, there's a lot of research and development and a lot written and discussed and taught about how to understand the interaction of complex systems. This is what people of the Edo period were doing all across the board uh, through the entire time. Uh, there's a great you know, advantage that the nation had as well in terms of ethics and values. This is a famous uh, water basin, a tsukubai at Ryoanji Temple in Kyoto, and the inscription is a bit of an anagram. Uh, it's four characters, all have the central square, the character for mouth in them, and in Japanese it's ware ta, tada taru o shiru. Taru o shiru. And there's different ways to translate it, but you could say, all I need is enough, all I need to know is what is enough, all I care about is enough. And, and this is a Zen saying, this is a Zen uh, way of thinking. Uh, get rid of the extraneous things. Don't try to overconsume. Don't try to have too much. Don't try to possess. Uh, just think about what is essential. And I think this is also connected with traditional Shinto thinking as well of man's place in the world. There are many gods and many forces surrounding us and we are embedded in them as, as only one part and not the most significant part. It's very different from Western thinking. But these values helped uh, Edo, people of the Edo period to cope with these problems. Now, faced with this terrible deforestation, which the uh, Edo, you know, people, the leaders of the Edo period understood was the key problem, uh, the first thing they did was, let's get the information we need. And one way they did that was by counting every tree in the country, sending teams of people. Uh, often they would be led by samurai who are very well educated, uh, literate, numerate, uh, local people who know the forest would go together as teams and and check the condition of the forest and literally count the trees and identify the best ones, the healthiest ones, find the parts of the forest that were not healthy, that needed work, that could benefit from careful cutting, for instance. Uh, and this took a, a few decades, but it is a very, very important source of information. Again, the fact that the country was so literate uh, and had such a great publishing industry meant that uh, a, a daimyo, a local lord, could commission uh, someone to go research this and then they would compile this and print it uh, as books and distribute it back to the people who can make use of it. This was a brilliant, brilliant aspect of uh, Edo period society. And citizens constantly were monitoring their environment and thinking about how to use it restoratively. Um, there's something called the Satoyama, which is often translated as the village mountains, the mountains near a village, which were, which were a, a, an important resource for food, for firewood, for almost everything needed to support daily life. And local people were constantly investigating this and, and, and finding out what uh, the situation was. 
Um, in terms of some of these other aspects of circularity that we're trying to promote, one is this upcycling and, and try to design things that are modular so things can be reused. I just want to talk a little bit about what happened back then when a building was demolished. Uh, and it was really pretty fascinating. Pretty much every single part of it uh, could be used. Uh, for instance, the uh, large wooden beams, etc. Um, those were immediately marketable. People would come and buy those. They were lumber yards in Edo and in other major cities that specialized in recycled timber. Floorboards could be planed smooth and, and reused. The roofing tiles, they would last for decades. Someone would instantly want to come and use those. Uh, things like roofing tiles, uh, shingles that could be used for, for fuel. Uh, other things like um, nails. Iron was almost precious because it took so much fuel to make it and also because iron was relatively scarce. This would be recycled. Uh, things like the, the doors, the fusuma, the shoji, and the tatami mats, these were all modular and could be instantly taken and put to use in another house. Uh, even the stones that were the foundations of the building or the earth that made the wall, these things could also be easily recycled. Uh, and uh, everything was refurbished, this, this refurbishment loop. Everything was refurbished. In this picture, the person on the right is fixing someone's wooden shoes, their getta. The person on the left is fixing someone's tobacco pipe. And this was done constantly. Things were refurbished. There were, there were lots of people doing this in Edo. Uh, again, this prolonging the life of, uh, the usable life of things, uh, uh, the full util utilization of resources, this was done constantly for everything. And rice is a great example. Of course, the reason rice was grown was as food. And this was mainly they wanted to end up with white rice, sorry, uh, with white rice, uh, which was valuable as tax, et cetera. A lot of people ate brown rice. But the first thing was that there was a hull, what's called the momigara, that would be removed. And of course, that could either be uh, used as a product, used for abrasive, used uh, to put in pillows, used for a lot of other things, or it could just be put into the, the agricultural cycle. Again, back as this restorative thing, uh, as mulch or as fertilizer. Uh, the, the nuka, the bran on the rice, was also used for uh, making pickles or for skin care and other things. Uh, and again, when that was done, you could also bring that back to the agricultural cycle as well. But the rice straw was amazing. It's a byproduct, but they use it for everything from shoes to raincoats to, to floor mats to bags to, to roofing material. And again, when this was done, that could be composted or used as fertilizer, or it could also be burned. And when this was burned, uh, the ash, which was high in potassium, also was very, very valuable. Uh, this was then recycled or brought into things like ceramics and metal making. So we have a system here with just this growing this rice where everything is looping back to the top. It's restoring the, the environment, it's restoring the agricultural productivity, or it's uh, again going back into the process, the, agro, the, the, the system at, at, as a resource at the top. Uh, and in the city of Edo, for, in terms of product uh, redistribution, there was over 500 used clothing sellers. Used clothing was just something everyone did. And there were over 1,000 recycling and refurbishing businesses, 1,000 of them. This was just part of daily life. So uh, I want to say that a circular economy, if we're wondering what that would be like, it would look a lot like the Edo economy. It doesn't mean using the same materials or the same designs for everything, but it would have the same principles. Uh, so. To end, I just want to point out that the circular economy model uh, adheres so closely to Edo period environmental principles uh, for resource and design that Edo can serve as a prototype and inspiration, teaching us the many benefits of living in a highly developed circular economy. Uh, and the last image here is uh, most of these images uh, come from my book, Just Enough.